beginning of exercise psychology uh, was really a series of papers by uh, William Morgan in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Uh, and it was an attempt, I think, to give empirical basis, an empirical basis to personal observations. So the personal observations were that when people exercise, or at least people that have some connection to exercise, they feel better. But as Morgan said, this is 1971, this is probably the first study uh, that looked at acute uh, effects of physical activity. Unfortunately, this feeling better sensation has not been corroborated by objective uh, psychologic data. Now, several years later, this is 1985, there were several studies by that point. So the conclusion was under normal circumstances, most individuals report that they feel good or feel better following vigorous exercise. So if you look at the uh, exercise psychology literature now, decades later, uh, most of the textbooks <coughs> unanimously endorse this same conclusion. Exercise makes people uh, feel better. Now, it, it makes us good to say that, right? Uh, it is a proud um, statement to make for our field. It makes us proud to say that exercise makes people feel better. It makes the students uh, uh, feel good about the area that they're uh, going in. So this is the, the textbook knowledge at this point. Exercise makes people feel better. Some people say all, some people say most people feel better when they exercise. You need moderate or vigorous intensity to get that feel better sensation. And then there is a mind over muscle argument in that uh, the feel better effect has a lot to do with how you think about exercise. So I'm going to let you look at the picture for a second. These are three examples of other activities that make people feel better. <laughs> And I would make the argument that when something makes somebody feel better, you can't stop them from doing it. They can't wait to do it again. So if exercise makes people feel better, why are we having such a difficult time convincing people to exercise? So this was really the starting point of my journey in this field because I never felt that we made a lot of sense. I think we were being contradictory in our, in our statements as a field. So um, I happened to be in uh, the UK in 2007, and the, the British Heart Foundation was starting a new campaign. It's a charity that raises funds for uh, heart disease-related research. Uh, and as part of the campaign, they were publicizing the results of a, of a survey that they do. And in fact, they update the survey every few years. So what percentage of people in the UK would not exercise even if their life depended on it? The, the answer was too shocking. So I felt compelled to go online and look at how the question was actually asked. And the question was asked, would you exercise if you knew your life depended on it? So what do you think the answer was? Would you, what percentage? 62% said no, I wouldn't. Uh, what percentage of the respondents uh, said that they find exercise fun? Once again, I went online, looked at the question, do you find exercise fun? Straightforward. The percentage was 4%. So this was one of those moments where you feel that the, the scientific research is perhaps moving in one direction and we have created a little bubble for ourselves and we keep telling each other exercise makes people feel great and then we have a party and celebrate it and then the society out there has a very different opinion and would probably cringe if they ever listen to an exercise psychology lecture where people celebrate the fact that everybody feels great. So I like to I like to mingle with the people. I leave the ivory tower sometimes and I, I start conversations. So 
you, you have to open your eyes to the public perception of exercise. And if you open your eyes to the public perception of exercise, you can miss, you know, the exercise sucks uh, uh, merchandise, right? There's the I hate to exercise book, and then there's the official I hate to exercise book, and all, all that stuff. So years ago, um, I felt that we need to start from the ground up. We need to rebuild this entire line of research. And this was really the, the essence of my uh, 2003 lecture here at NASPA, I explained how we should change this line of research. So if you want to find that exercise makes people feel good, uh, this is what you should do. Uh, study only ultra-fit exercise science students in their early 20s. <laughs> Measure how participants feel only before exercise starts and then several minutes after it ends, but not during. Use measures that capture feel better changes while excluding relevant feel worse changes. Focus only on the group mean and ignore individual differences or the responses of subgroups. And to show that at least moderate or vigorous intensity is required, then study only moderate and vigorous intensity. Okay, so if you follow this roadmap, I think you will get to the point that we were in until 85, and I would make me even claim until now. So in 2003, uh, I, I had a discussion uh, about how we should measure affect, when we should measure affect, how we should standardize exercise intensity, how uh, should we analyze change. Um, this is an expression of how I felt in my efforts to convince uh, people in the field that we need a change. Um, I, I, I think I was thinking far enough into the future that I, I had the good sense to try and produce publications or work that would help the, the younger generation, the newer people coming into the field to have the instructions that I didn't have when I was starting out. So everything that I've learned about how to measure affect, for example, I, I've put in a book. So instead of studying for 25 years and fighting to find arguments, now it's easier to find that information and, and that rationale. Um, the same thing for analyzing exercise data. Now what, what, what is an exercise psychologist doing, you know, building software to analyze ventilatory data? That, that's insane, right? Uh, but I had to do it because it wasn't available. And then I had the, the sense that once I build it, then I can offer it to other people and they can use it so we can all move forward. Uh, <clears throat> so where are we today? I, 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 I restate um, the previous conclusions and I put the, the, the twist on based on uh, what we have learned in those past several years. Some doses of exercise can make some individuals feel better. Most adults who happen to be sedentary, who happen to be overweight, feel worse during exercise. Lower intensities rather than higher are generally more, more pleasant, and cognitive interventions, those, those mind over muscles interventions, are effective, but they're effective within a certain range, so only within a limited uh, range of intensity. When you're struggling, when you're working out at 90% of your max, it doesn't matter if you say to yourself, you know, I'm the greatest that ever lived. <laughs> so this is one of my bragging moments. I hope to be one of the very few bragging moments during the, uh, the lecture. Uh, you know, in, in, it was a striking thing to observe that in exercise psych we were producing hundreds of publications on the effects of exercise on pleasure. And then you were looking, if you were to look at the general psychology literature, it was almost as if we never existed. They were never paying any attention to it. So they were using exercise to produce, in general psych, to produce what they called affectless or contentless arousal. And at the same time, we had 300 papers in exercise psych saying, you know, exercise has effects on affect. So it was a bizarre um, state of affairs at the time. So one of my proud moments is that now, when you look at the mainstream affective psychology, Look at this statement, exercise provides perhaps the most well-characterized way to manipulate 
physiological arousal producing an affective change. We went from producing contentless arousal to the best characterized manipulation. And best characterized manipulation, you have to put that in context because think that how many decades of opioid research is there? How many decades of alcohol research is there? And looking at the effects of affect. So thousands of people working in those areas and yet exercise is the most well characterized. So I think that that's, that's a nice achievement. So uh, what's that characterization? So if you look at the graph, this is the range of exercise intensity over here. You can think of it as being divided into three domains, moderate intensity below something we call the ventilatory threshold, then heavy intensity, which is between the ventilatory threshold and another ventilatory marker we call the respiratory compensation point, and then severe intensity from the RCP to VO2 uh, peak. Less pleasure over here, more pleasure over here. So when you start, in the moderate intensity, you get the feel better effect. And that's fairly reliable, but there's a caveat that I will address in a minute. How can we keep people within the moderate range and how feasible or realistic that is? If you look at responses within the heavy domain, uh, that's where you begin to see some individual variation. So you will have the individual that once they enter the heavy domain, they begin their affective decline, and then within the heavy domain, you may have another individual that actually still feels better. Once you get into the severe range, then everybody uh, feels worse and, and you have a homogeneity of, uh, of responses. So you can think of the range as a zone of homogeneity where, where we have mostly pleasure responses, another zone of homogeneity where you have displeasure responses, and then there is this zone in the middle where you have individual variation, inter-individual differences. Some people feel better, some people feel worse. Now, how about the mechanisms that are underlie these types of, of responses? So, we can think of the moderate, heavy, and severe ranges as no appreciable exercise-related challenge, a manageable challenge, so it's definitely present, it's, it's getting tough, but you can struggle through it, and then unmanageable challenge. So, in, if you think of it in terms of physiological responses, or what we call interoceptive factors, the perception of the physiological responses, those are pretty low to begin with, they begin to rise during the, in the heavy range, and then they become really prevalent in the severe range. So those will affect your affective responses. But at the same time, there are cognitive factors, such as your self, a sense of self-efficacy, or such as your uh, uh, apprehension about your physical appearance, for example. Uh, and again, you will see here that there is substantial inter-individual variability that manifests itself within the heavy uh, range as this becomes more challenging, as the interoceptive factors become more challenging, your cognitive factors and individual differences in those cognitive factors will become very influential, determining whether you will feel better in this range or worse. But once you get again into the severe range, then the influence of cognitive factors declines and what you have is the, the domination of, uh, of your affective responses by interoceptive factors. I hope that that makes uh, sense. So, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is how our physiology responds uh, in the moderate, heavy, and severe range. This is the relation between oxygen uptake, oxygen going in, and carbon dioxide coming out. And you will see that there are two breakpoints. This is the first, that's the ventilatory threshold, where the relation changes from one to one, right? And then we have the second breakpoint, which is the respiratory compensation point. These two numbers are just examples, but individuals vary tremendously uh, as to where those particular uh, breakpoints are. So if you have a sedentary 
uh, average uh, person, uh, a good example would be that the ventilatory threshold will be around 50%, 48, 50%. But if you look at uh, professional cyclists, that can be as high as 75 or 80 or 85%, right? And then the same thing for the respiratory compensation point. A good example for an average person might be 75 or 80%, but when you look at professional athletes, that could be 95%. So, within the moderate range, remember we're predicting homogeneously positive responses. So we have produced data. Where is Sue? We have produced data. Uh, we have replicated the data across different countries. And you, you get a pretty robust uh, feel better effect with things like self-paced walking, right? You don't put the idea of um, uh, no pain, no gain in people's heads. You just present it as a physical activity stimulus. You tell people to self-pace, and you will get a fairly robust uh, feel-better effect. Now, what happens in the, in the heavy range? Remember, this is where we are expecting individual variability. Some people feeling better, some people feeling worse. So this is 60% of VO2 max on the bike. And each line represents at least one individual. If you count the lines going up, they're about 45% of the lines. If you count the lines going down, it's about 45% of the lines. And then there are about 10% of the lines that don't change. Okay? So if sometimes we think, give them moderate intensity, because moderate intensity is the safest bet. It's not too low, it's not too high, it's somewhere in the middle. In fact, if you give moderate intensity, defined as, in this case, 60%, of VO2 max, it's a gamble because you will get some people feeling better and some people feeling worse. And then remember that the, our last range is the severe range. And of course, once you get in the severe range, this is an example, things begin to take a turn for the worse above the ventilatory point, uh, ventilatory threshold, and then it just gets worse and worse and worse until you uh, max out. And that's fairly homogeneous. So, 95 or 100 percent of the people feel worse within that range. So we have summarized the evidence uh, a few years ago. Evidence was, has now been produced by um, many different labs around the world. This is another proud moment in the fact that the data that we produced have been replicated. As you know, there's a replication crisis in psychology. So to, to have data that other people are doing in Australia or, or the UK and finding the exact same pattern, I think that, that is, uh, that's, an, that's something important. So in this case, we have pulled data together from different labs in different countries. Each dot represents uh, one experiment, okay? Uh, but the experiments could be from different people in different countries. And this is the relation between lactate accumulation down here and the percentage of people who report improvements in how they feel. So this is the relation. You can see that even with a low lactate accumulation, we already have a hard time, right? It's only 50%, approximately 50 to 60% of people who report that they feel better during exercise. But once you get to around four, then it's almost nobody. And then conversely, the percentage who report uh, declines in how they feel starts with about um, 20 to 30 percent for very low lactate accumulation, and then it gets to about 80 percent um, higher up. Now, I said before, you know, you could look at this and say, great, so all we need to do then is keep people within the moderate range. Moderate, remember, means not, not too low, not too high. Moderate here means under the ventilatory threshold. Unfortunately, that's easier said than done because we are now have a very challenging situation in our hands where people are just too unfit, too sedentary and it's very difficult to keep them within the moderate range, keep them under the ventilatory threshold. So these are actual data from one of the, the participants in our, in our studies. We only take uh, healthy people. So they need to bring us a, a, a paper from their physician saying that they don't have any chronic disease because we don't want to have a, a physician present to supervise the tests, right? We want to keep it safe. So, what, what is the condition of those people that we sample who come to us and say, I'm healthy, I don't take any, any medication? This is a 41-year-old lady, 
uh, 61 kilograms BMI of 25, so on the cusp of between overweight and obese, but chronically sedentary. And we usually take people who have been sedentary for at least a year, but a lot of people come to us and they've been sedentary for 10 or 15, right? So the, what's the situation here? The situation is, is, is pretty uh, bleak. If you look at the, the VO2s, and I, you know, we're psychologists, we don't usually talk about VO2 maxes, but I think you will understand. So VO2 max of 17, to give you a sense of perspective, when I was taking my undergrad exercise physiology, our professors um, said one, once, uh, you may even in some cases of extreme deconditioning find VO2 maxes in the teens in people in their 70s. And it was a packed auditorium like this one and you could hear a collective, oh, how can you even live with a VO2 max in the teens? So now you, we get people in their 40s, otherwise characterized as healthy, and they have max, maxes in the teens. Now if the max is in the teens, and the VT is, let's be generous and say 60% of max, that means that the VT is about 10 ml per kg per minute. Remember that your, your resting metabolic rate is about 3.5. So then you have between 3.5 and 10 ml per kg per minute to keep somebody within the moderate range. Let me translate what that uh, 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 passage in French uh, actually means. All right, so these are examples that are just below the ventilatory, uh, these are examples of activities that are just below the ventilatory threshold for a person like this. Moving about indoors, uh, slow walking, uh, mild stretching, fishing, but from a seated position, <laughs> light dusting. So imagine being an exercise practitioner and having to come up with an exercise prescription for somebody. And I, again, I have to remind you, healthy, right? healthy, no chronic disease, no medication, and these are your options for exercise under the ventilatory threshold. You want to see examples of, of uh, activities above the ventilatory threshold? Slow walking, carrying groceries, waltzing, fishing, but from a standing position, cleaning windows, sweeping and mopping floors. So now I, I hope you begin to see the, the, the practical implications or practical relevance of, of what we're talking about. Okay, so to make it an even stronger point, let me go outside the field and go to the field of cardiology. Uh, one of the challenges has been how do you prioritize people for a cardiac transplant if they have chronic heart failure? How do you determine that death for a certain person is imminent and you have to put them at the top of the list and give them the first transplant? One of the criteria that indicates that that person is basically days away from death is a VO2 max of 14 ml per kg per minute. The lady in my example had a max of 17 and she was considered healthy. Okay? All right, so <clears throat> very long introduction. I'm going to be doing some skipping, it seems like. Uh, so let's start with where we can take this and look at implications for physical activity behavior. So I took two papers. One is talking about the great achievements of, of public health. And the other is talking about the catastrophic failures of public health. Raise your hand if you think that exercise is in the top category. Very smart audience. So exercise is actually the main topic of the second paper. So we are considered now a catastrophic failure in the annals of public health. Because despite all the efforts, there has been no change since all, since all the, the campaigns started to promote physical activity and exercise. So a lot of us, I think, use this example in our lecturing with students because it's such a mind-boggling statistic. So as you know, uh, we are now past the point where we're trying to convince each other that we are doing fairly okay based on self-reported physical activity data, because unfortunately now we have objectively assessed physical activity data, so the bubble has burst. 
So what percentage of Americans 20 to 59 who partici uh, participate in physical activity of at least moderate intensity for at least 30 minutes a day on at least five days a week? 10% said the optimist in the room. It's 3.5. When you look at people over the age of uh, 60, then it's 2.5. Now, you would think that that's Americans, right? And of course, when, I mean, just look at them, right? Uh, <clears throat> but no, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not just Americans. So other countries now have nationwide surveys with objective assessments of physical activity. So this is in Canada. Based on accelerometers, 4.8% of adults did 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. In the UK, um, in England, 6% uh, of men, 4% of women uh, did met the minimum uh, recommended uh, amount. So. I'm not an optimist. Um, I call my, myself a realist. My wife calls me a pessimist. Um, here's how I look at this. Uh, we are now approaching our 50th anniversary, approximately, as a field. So we're not mathematics, you know, we're not physics, we're not chemistry with centuries of history, but we are now approaching our first half century. So we should be considering the issue of our societal impact and societal relevance. And the way that I try to explain this, how have we changed society? The way that I, I try to explain it is, where is our bend your knees? You, we sometimes joke with our biomechanics friends about their lack of theory and all of that. And, and my response is, well, they have convinced everyone in the world that if you want to keep your back safe, bend your knees. And my challenge to this field is point to one thing that exercise psychology has changed that has made a global difference. So tell me one thing that physical education teachers are doing differently based on exercise psychology research. Or tell me something that fitness centers or gyms around the world are doing differently because of exercise psychology research. And I know that some people will say, you know, but there's this example and that example. But I, the truth is, you would struggle. You would struggle to find one thing in which we have made a global difference in practice norms. So I think that our guiding light going forward is that we should be considering that question. How can we now, that we are 50 years old as a field, change global practice norms? <clears throat> uh, my, the basis of my depression uh, is this observation. It's that we have relinquished the public square to people who have no scientific basis for their practice norms. Um, we have relinquished the public square to people who just have commercial or marketing concerns, and they, they are destroying what we are trying to fix. But everybody is listening to them, and we are absent from that conversation, case in point. Okay, so <clears throat> my, the title of my talk was Escape from Cognitivism. So what I'm going to suggest is that it may be time now, with a sense of perspective and looking back at our achievements or lack thereof, to start a conversation about our theoretical perspective. So as one example, where is Claudio? Excellent book, I paid my, my good money, thank you. Have you bought mine? <laughs> so, um, and, and the truth of the matter is, it all boils down to a small set of theories. These are the officially sanctioned theories, right? The, these are the theories that we teach our students. These are the theories that we tell practitioners. These are the theories that you're supposed to know to get a PhD in our field. That's the standard line, right? And if you know this, then we consider you sufficiently educated in exercise psychology. But if you look at the theories with a sense of perspective, you have to realize that they are all derivatives, all products of the same 
perspective, and that's the cognitivist perspective. So we, we haven't really started that conversation. Are we okay with the cognitivist perspective? Do we understand the assumptions behind the cognitivist perspective? If we are not okay with the assumptions, then maybe we, we have to start rethinking uh, this, this line of thinking. So, um, you know, I would call this a, a cognitivist paradigm uh, in, in a Kuhnian sense. So Kuhn says that when you, when you sign up for a paradigm, uh, you pay a price. And the price is phenomena that don't fit the box are often not seen. Normal science does not aim at novelties of fact or theory, and when successful, finds none. Immense restriction of the scientist's vision and so on. So <clears throat> this is my, my challenge to students. I don't think that I've, I've lost this bet yet. Uh, so my challenge is, can you match these folks to their respective theories? And of course, everyone can, right? Because if you can't, then you're not going to graduate with an exercise psychology uh, degree, right? But now, can you tell me, can you, if you're a student, can you really articulate to me William James's theory of emotion and compare it to Walter Cannon's theory of emotion? Can you tell me what Paul Ekman is famous for? Can you tell me what Robert Zayans and Richard Lazarus were debating about in the early 1980s? These are fundamental, fundamental issues in the study of human emotions. I don't think that we are training our students to, to understand even those fundamentals. So if that's the case, then perhaps we're living in a paradigm. Perhaps we have created this bubble that has restricted our vision. Because you have to acknowledge that humans have emotional reactions to exercise. And you have to acknowledge that those reactions are important. Even important as motivational factors. So one uh, issue with cognitive, uh, the cognitive paradigm is the assumption that the input is always information and that this information is processed in a rational manner. Therefore, our decision making, our behavioral decision making, actually follows some very logical cause and effect uh, rules and follows in a rational, logical manner from the information. Do we agree with that? Is that how humans make decisions? If you don't agree with that, if you think that there's an irrational component to human decision making, then you cannot endorse the cognitive perspective. You have to critically rethink the cognitive perspective. So I'm not gonna go through this, uh, but I, I urge you to start reading the cognitive theories with a critical eye. In this case, uh, Bandura explains to us that we are really computers, walking computers, right? We constantly collect information, we store it in memory, then we enter it into algorithms that make probabilistic predictions about the future consequences of our action, and then depending on that prediction into the future, we choose behavioral option A or behavioral option B. If you question that that is how humans make decisions, then you have to start rereading Bandura instead of just memorizing the sources of self-efficacy information to pass your PhD exam. By the same token, I was invited to give another lecture at another country that shall remain nameless recently, and all the students everywhere were studying attitudes, norms, and intentions as far as the eye can see. And you see that human potential, you see those young minds that could be generating new ideas, they could be challenging the system, they could be creative, and instead they take the advisor's research and they just extend it to a different group of cancer patients, the 25th in a row, right? We have to start thinking a little differently from that, I think. So in this case, theory of planned behavior, as you know, rests on the assumption that humans are rational beings, that decisions are always rational, 
And as they say here, the decision to act rests ultimately on the information that people have. So how do you change human behavior? Just give them more information or just give them more compelling information and you'll be fine. Question whether that has worked for us, please. So if we burst the bubble and start looking outside the bubble, outside of psychology even, and I'm taking you to another field called behavioral economics. Behavioral economics has nothing to do with money. It's the study of human decision making, but without necessarily the restrictive influence of the cognitivist paradigm. Yes, there are cognitivists in behavioral economics, but there are also people who think differently. Herbert Simon came up with uh, this notion of bounded rationality, which I'm gonna oversimplify and say, are human beings rational? Yes, to some extent. So they act all the time in a way that violates basic principles of rationality. A lot of human behavior demonstrates an irrational element. And it's very, very easy to demonstrate that. So for this very basic idea that rationality is bounded, Herbert Simon won the Nobel Prize in economics in 1978. The people who continued this line of research, uh, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, came up with this idea. So if we're not fully rational, what do we base our decisions on? And they came up with this notion of heuristics and biases. Heuristics are simple, simplified shortcuts, simplified rules. They are wrong a lot. They're not optimal, but they're the only thing that we really have if we want to address very complicated decisions that we lack the cognitive capacity or information for. So instead we just go, we follow a certain rule. And again, it's gonna be wrong sometime, but it's okay a lot of the time. And for this very basic concept, uh, they won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2002. Uh, this is Kahneman accepting it because Tversky had passed away. So if you look outside, look at medicine, for example. In medicine, you tell people to do something, they don't do it, they've been struggling with this for decades. So now the, the first voices out there who are beginning to say patients may not always be the rational actors that we imagine. We have to come to terms with this. We have to. We have to follow the example of other fields that are now acknowledging this, this basic fact. So what I focus on is one of the heuristics that uh, Kahneman and Tversky uh, talked about, and uh, it's called the affect heuristic. And there's nothing to the affect heuristic really more than what we all know as human beings, people gravitate towards things that are pleasant and they avoid the things that are unpleasant. This is ancient Greek, of course, uh, wisdom. So again, if you look at outside psychology proper uh, and you, you look at fields that uh, their thinking is driven a lot by practice, you see things like this, um, drug abuse. Why do drug abusers abuse drugs? And of course, one of perhaps the most prevalent theory is, well, there's a hedonic effect, right? They, they like it, they get a kick out of it, so that's what creates a drug abuse, right? In psychology, we would say that's because their attitude towards being drug-free is weak, and we need to provide them with additional education. Uh, hedonic hunger, why do people overeat? Well, there is a homeostatic component to appetite, and then there's a hedonic component to appetite. That's the, the prevalent theory in that field, right? So overeating has a lot to do with the hedonic component of eating behavior, of course, right? But in psychology, we would say, why do people overeat? That's because they're not appropriately educated about caloric balance issues, right? If you look at physical therapy, physical therapists are struggling with the issue of non-adherence to physical therapy regimens. So they have come up with this concept of kinesiophobia, which is of course the fear of movement for people for whom movement 
is painful. So people with low back pain, people with neosteoarthritis, you tell them that it's good for them to be active, they're not, because even though they understand the benefit cognitively, when they try to do it, it hurts. And that's an obvious thing to the physical therapy practitioner, it's not as obvious to us who would, of course, apply our self-efficacy intervention to suppress the pain. Now, when you ask people about the reasons for being active or reasons for being inactive, they are gonna tell you fun and enjoyment. The presence of fun and enjoyment makes me wanna join. The absence of fun and enjoyment makes me wanna leave the program. Fun and enjoyment were reported more often as predictors of participation and non-participation than perceived health benefits. This is a review of qualitative studies that I don't think too many people are citing. So this is the way that we are, we are thinking about the issue. Um, imagine that we have, this is a starting point, right? We have people with sedentary histories for 10, 20, 30 years. Those histories have profoundly changed the body. They have added more weight. They have reduced cardiovascular endurance. And at some point, uh, they, they try to start an exercise program, right? They get negative affective experience. If they are persistent, they're gonna go back a second time, a third time, a fourth time. They still get negative affective experiences. Exercise registers in their memory as unpleasant that diminishes intrinsic motivation, and they start avoiding exercise, which takes us back to here, and then we repeat the cycle. It's, it's a very sim simple, some people might say it's a very simplistic way of looking at things. Uh, I would, of course, counter that it's a very powerful way uh, to look at things. So, is there a theoretical basis for this? Is this just, uh, are we the only ones thinking in this way? So, so if, if you're, you're not aware, aware of this, there's this soma somatic marker uh, theory proposed by Damasio. This is just one example of many where Damasio had been studying or has been studying people with specific neurological damage in areas of the brain that are related to affective responses. These are very highly localized, very focal uh, uh, areas. And they behave like this. What do you want to do today? I want to go to the store. Can you give me all the advantages and disadvantages of going to the store? Yes. And they can produce, they can readily produce a list of all the pros and all the cons associated with a certain option. And then you tell them, now can you make a decision? Do you want to go or don't you? They're completely incapable of doing that. They can articulate all the reasons, but they cannot make a decision. And they cannot make a decision because they lack areas of the brain responsible for encoding and storing and interpreting affective responses. So, just one example. So now uh, we, we, we are at the point where we have the first small set of uh, studies examining the relationship between affective responses to exercise and then physical activity behavior, either concurrently or uh, in the future. This is from a uh, uh, review that just came out. Uh, they claim 24 relevant studies. A positive change in the basic affective response during moderate intensity exercise was linked to future physical activity. The studies are not great, they're not large, the methodology is still evolving, but the evidence is there that how you respond effectively to a bout of exercise then translates to how much physical activity you will choose to do in the future. So this is what I see as, as our future. Um, we have to grow out of the cognitive paradigm now that has led us for half a century. We I'm not, not suggesting that, that we should, should throw it away, away right? right? Please, Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that people do not have rational decision making. But we also have to add to the rational part of decision making the possibility of non-rational, potentially affective decision making. So we have to move to a dual process perspective 
and there are other fields, of course, that have preceded us in, in that direction. They acknowledge that there is this deliberative, information-based, very cognitive, very rational type of decision-making, but there is also this primitive, affectively driven, not necessarily rational part to decision-making. There are debates in this field, which one is the de default mode? Is our default mode to just act impulsively, or is the default mode to cognitively process all the uh, behavioral options? We can discuss about this. This is secondary. But at this point, I think our priority is to just consider the possibility that we don't just have the rational mechanism, we also have an additional affectively based, potentially irrational mechanism. So, where is Ralph? Hats off to you. So, this has already been presented. The idea has already been presented. You know, we, we've been talking in exercise psychology um, about a conflict, uh, about there, there's a need to uh, look at exercise as a unique challenge, a unique type of experience. This is the uniqueness. The uniqueness is that you have a very strong, I think in most people, understanding of the health benefits. If you look at Western societies where people are bombarded all the time with the health message, more than 90% of people are willing to say exercise is of tremendous value for health. So why aren't you acting? Because if you then ask the follow-up question, does exercise makes you feel good? The answer is no. So we have this conflict of one mechanism in us pushing us in the direction of exercise and then another mechanism pushing us in the opposite direction. And that's our, our, our negative past affective experiences, given the fact, of course, that we are out of shape, overweight, as Western societies. So, uh, I wanted to say a lot more, but I uh, usually ramble. Uh, and therefore, we can say the rest uh, for those of you kind enough to uh, join me for the uh, Meet the Expert session which is in A004 at 2 to 3.30, so we'll have plenty of time. So with that, thank you so very much for your patience. Enjoy the river of Bell. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.